countless hours of morally chaining yourself to your desk and forcing productivity has been the picture that parents, students, and educators have painted for so long, exemplifying what discipline and most of all self-control looks like and how it should be applied to achieve the oversimplified and subjective phenomena of success. Yet, where do we stand now? In an era where procrastination is the new pink, self-control has never been this absent from our everyday, up-to-date and organized lives. While providing us with the technologies that have without a doubt enhanced our learning experience and uncovered digital gold mines for information, our predecessors, over, our predecessors overestimated our ability to truly focus on what's important and to press pause on what's not. But how do we do this exactly? Well, self-control often involves manipulating our actions to delay gratification. What type of gratification, you might ask? Well, there are two types, short-term and long-term. And the one we really want, and we really, we, really, we really need to control ourselves to achieve, is long-term gratification, which is often more beneficial, fulfilling, and ideal in comparison to short-term pleasures, which are often a lot more addictive and non-permanent. But this type of mindset is usually opposed and challenged by emerging desires that oppose our, ide our ideals, values, and beliefs. And so, and so it's our responsibility to sit down and do that pending assignment and overlook all these distractions. But how do we do that? What if we can change this never-ending cycle of distractions, of inattention? What if we can change it all? What if we could press pause? How would we do that? Well, I want you all to meet a little somebody who's rather, who's rather profound in this field of self-control, who's contributed so much to answering this question in particular, Walter Mischel. His sweet success was the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment, uh, gathering around 653 preschoolers to do this for 15 minutes. The goal of the experiment was to identify the means by which little children applied self-control. And they did this by giving them a goal where they had to manage themselves for an unknown period of time, by the end of which they would receive a marshmallow only if they didn't eat the one in front of them. And it was a success. They successfully managed to to identify the three main ways by which children apply self-control. The first of which is self-distraction, where they willfully remove themselves from the situation. The second one is reconstructing perception, where they convert the hot stimulus of the marshmallow into something a lot cooler, like cotton balls, something less tempting. And the last one was redirecting focus where instead of focusing on the sweet squishiness of the mars marshmallow, they focused on, for example, its shape, texture, color, things that were less tempting and obviously less consumable. But this isn't how we usually approach self-control. This is not how it usually manifests in us. And Michel knew, knew this. So he sat down to refine and create the three principles by which humans apply self-control. The first one, is the ability to suppress or override competing attentional and behavior, behavioral, behavioral responses. So it's the act of choosing one behavior over the other to maintain an ongoing flow of attention. So you might feel stressed all of a sudden and have this urge to take your phone and check Instagram or light a cigarette if you're a grown up. And not doing so is an act of self-control. It's a conscious choice. The second is suppressing unwanted thoughts. We all have intrusive thoughts, don't we? The sudden, um, that sudden invasive feeling, the sudden invasive thought that, what should I cook today? Oh my God, I didn't sleep last night. This is all the stuff that you would normally never think about up until you start to do that math assignment. And our brains are amazingly skillful at tuning these out. I'll get to that in a bit. And the third and last principle is blocking unwanted information, where we tune out internal stimuli, like a sudden chocolate craving, and external stimuli, like the screams of a child. And just, just as we do, um, just as little children are often blamed for 
uh, participating in the criminal act of selective hearing, our brains would do the same thing, but with self-control. But if we're all so proficient in doing this, why is it so different from, from why are you so different in your skill of, of applying self-control compared to the person next to you? What caused this, um, is this enormous difference in the first place? Well, one of the biggest reasons is suppression. And it might sound like an enormous red flag that you would completely condemn, but the reality is suppression is amazingly good at nurturing self-control. Think about it like this. In a house with lots of rules, you have people, residents, who are amazingly skilled at following these rules and also helping others to follow them too. And that's exactly what a, a study in Germany did. The Douche Post Foundation looked into West and East Germany during post-state division. Of course, this is a much more extreme example than, for example, a house, but it showed a lot more than we would have initially expected. The first thing they noticed, and that I met already mentioned, is that suppression contributes to higher self-control levels. But, at, but age also did the same. The older you were, the more self-control you could apply, and the better you could apply it. And this is because self-control is something that comes, with the, the, that comes with consciousness and the ability to manage your impulses, and that comes with age. Everything after this is actually rather contradictory to what we normally believe. Things like compulsory schooling, gender and adulthood, and family background have absolutely no relation to self-control levels. The fact is, things like family background only extend their influence up until childhood, having minimal influence on what we will be in adulthood. Another study on the similar sample of Germans looked into things like personality traits, intelligence, and economic preferences in relation to self-control. And what they realized was the same thing. As you get older, you have higher self-control. And self-control doesn't discriminate based on gender. And last of all, self-control isn't a result of education, but a cause of it, to the point that the likelihood of having graduated high school increased by 10% in the population. And the study also found a few other interesting facts. The first one of it, which is health. The higher self-control you had, the healthier you were, you were later on in life. You had better mental health, lower BMI scores. You were more satisfied with your life in general and led a much more active one. Your wages were better. You, you had a less likelihood of being unemployed. And even your intelligence is influenced by self-control. Something we regard as something we regard as rather odd. Fluid intelligence, which is the intelligence that I'm talking about, is something extremely important, but it has a negative correlation with self-control because it's something that's extremely distractible. And so even our biology joins in the, in the equation. Mothers with, with higher self-control had sons with higher self-control. Fathers with higher self-control had daughters with higher self-control. And if both parents had high self-control, their children were more likely to be well-behaved and pro-social. Exemplifying how, how we nurture self-control in youth and how it can reflect in their behaviors and even in the behaviors of the parents who had significantly better parenting skills. And so we have come to realize that the flimsy excuses we make, like, oh, you're a girl, or oh, you, you didn't stay in school that long, are actually rather unimportant when it comes to self-control. What really matters is experience and active practice. Practicing self-control throughout life ensures that you're better, you're better at it and you have better life outcomes later on. It's not about where you came from, but it's about how you do it. And so, suppression, for that reason, is an extremely important asset in nurturing self-control. The, the governing bodies that surround us, that dictate our every single action, determine how well their populations nurture the sense of self-control. How well they control them determines how well those people control themselves. So that's where we all are now. A lot of us have low or high self-control. 
And that's not where it stops, though. We can determine where we'll be later on, too, thanks to this extremely important trait. A study done by Michel triggered this initial question. He began asking, how can self-control influence adulthood outcomes? And what he realized 12 years later in one of his follow-up studies was that kids with higher self-control were more cognitively and academically competent. They were able to cope with stress in adolescence much better. But the thing is, when he looks into the generalizability of his results, it, they were rather negligible, unimportant, and undermined, and undermining the true potential of self-control. But he didn't stop at that. He wanted to actually see if self-control was as important as he believed it to be. And so he conducted one last follow-up study where he looked into things like weight, educational attainment, and net worth, forming an index consisting of 11 factors and analyzing their link to self-control. And what he realized was that self-control was able to predict 10 out of these 11 factors with an average correlation of 0 0.19, which might sound impressive, but is actually an indicator of a weak correlation. And, we re and he came to realize that he couldn't prove prove anything with this data. But this study wasn't going to end up rusting the whole, entire, the whole entire chain that would lead to something phenomenal. A preschool in Michigan was about to make that chain a lot stronger. The, the Perry Preschool Study through age 40 was led by David Wakehart and his colleagues, and it focused on, on nurturing IQ in economically disadvantaged children through social services. And so four years later, after the study was initially uh, launched, what they realized was that it proved insufficient in attaining the set goal. The kids weren't more noticeably intelligent than their peers, but they were still set apart by a multitude of factors. These kids were, were less likely to drop out of school less likely to be involved in crime, less likely to have drug or substance abuse problems, and were in fact going to have even, were in fact having fewer misdays of work, regardless of gender. And this was all because the study unintentionally trained these kids to be skilled in self-control. And for those of you who are interested in the economics of this whole thing, they even determined the result and benefit of this, the program. And what they realized was, for every dollar that they invested, they got $12.90 back. What does this mean, and where does it come from? Well, from education, taxes, welfare, and crime. These people were not only better in terms of health, they had higher wages, and they were involved less in crime, allowing them to not only benefit themselves, but the people around them, drastically. But this isn't where this, this journey ended. 10 years later, in Dunedin, New Zealand, another study took place, this time intentionally looking at self-control. And what they noticed was the exact same thing. When analyzing the, the crime, wealth, and health of their participants, they noticed that people had fewer health problems later on if they had higher self-control in childhood. They were better off in terms of finance. They had better parenting skills. Let, they were less likely to be involved in crime. And they didn't have that many substance problems in comparison to those with lower self-control in childhood. And so they even decided to, look a to focus a little bit more on adolescence. And they saw the same thing. People with higher self-control were less likely to start smoking by the age of 15, were less likely to drop out of secondary school with no educational qualifications, they were less likely to become unplanned teenage parents, all thanks to self-control. And that's not where the benefit stopped. It even helped the, the researchers predict future outcomes with amazing accuracy, better than IQ, social class, and eco economic status of origin. For things like financial success, which you would normally never associate with such a basic trait. And I've been talking quite a lot about crime, health, and wealth, but we all know why we're here. We're here for the academics. And 
There's a study for that too. Initiated by these three individuals, self-control was studied in undergraduate students, looking into much more detailed things other than GPA, but essentially focusing on that in particular. And what they noticed was that, yes, higher self-control was a part of getting higher, higher grades, but it was also the reason for reduced psychopathology, higher self-esteem, reduced binge eating and eating disorders, decreased alcohol and substance abuse, a higher likelihood of having a secure attachment, and having better interpersonal skills, along with things like better relationships, and having the ability to display appropriate and balanced emotional responses and reactions. An enormous list of things that practically have no relation to self-control. Why? Well, self-control reaches to the very edges of our day-to-day -day lives, our complex interactions, all of these, all of these innately human things. And this is because our every behavior, reaction, action, and perception is guided by self-control. The ability to control ourselves dictates the ability to, to be better people. And so I've been saying quite a lot, and but quite a lot, I mean a lot, a lot. But what I want you guys to understand is that self-control is an extremely important part of our futures. It is the leader in, in guiding us to create a generation of people who are not only extremely productive, but also masters of themselves. The fact that a preschool study can change the lives of hundreds so drastically begs the question why educators, policymakers, and even our own parents dismiss this crucial component of success. Instead of sitting kids down to memorize the timetables at age seven and write papers at 15, we should be teaching them how to control the most important thing of all, themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for a modern revolution, and this time, an internal one. Thank you.